Okay, hello everyone, and thanks for joining uh, the CR talk series. Um, we have quite a few people, uh, uh, not only from the IR lab, but also from the other labs in, in the, at UMass. We have a few uh, online audience uh, as well. My name is Hamad Zamani. Um, it's my pleasure to host Niranjan today. Um, Niranjan was one of our, the CIR uh, uh, former PhD students. He was working with James Allen. Um, he's now an assistant professor at Stony Brook University in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, he is the National Language, the Language Understanding and Reasoning Lab, LUNAR. Um, and uh, after leaving UMass, he did a postdoc at University of Washington and was one of the early members of the Allen Institute uh, for artificial intelligence or AI too. And uh, probably most of you know his work. Uh, he's doing amazing research, but also a lot of amazing paintings. So if you uh, see his paintings on social media and things like that, you, you'll, you'll see, you'll get excited. Okay, without further ado, uh, I'd like to ask you, John, um, to talk about what is multi hop QA and how to fix it. Here you go. Uh, thank you, Hamid. Thank you, everyone, for hosting me. Um, it just brings back so many pleasant memories. Um, I wish I could have made it uh, uh, to the trip in person, uh, but two body problems and, uh, and the kid uh, didn't let me uh, come this time, but I, but I hope to visit in person sometime uh, soon. Um, okay, so um, what I wanted to do today is to uh, to to talk about uh, one area of research that's uh, really of core interest to me, uh, which is uh, getting models to do multi-hop QA. Um, let's get into it. So if I can only move my slides somehow, my, oh, what's a presentation if you don't have a glitch, right? Um, okay, I may have to move my mouse, but that's fine. So, um, the, the work that I'm going to talk about today um, is led by uh, my wonderful student, Harsh Trivedi, and in collaboration with uh, Tushar and Ashish, uh, people in uh, Allen Institute. It's been a long running and fruitful collaboration for us with them. Um, so let's, let's dive right in. Um, when I say multi-hop QA, what do I mean by this? Um, I mean, any question answering setup where you actually have to combine different pieces of information that potentially come from different places in text or different sources, right? So that's my you know, sort of operational definition for what I mean by multi-hop QA. Uh, some may say you should call it multi-step. Uh, there is no necessarily a sequential way to answer things, but for, for the purpose of this talk, let's say multi-hop QA is where you need to combine uh, different pieces of information, right? So here's an example. Um, the question is, which country got independence when the Cold War started? And there's a bunch of different facts uh, that might be broadly pertinent to this particular question. And there are two specific fact pieces of information where one says Cold War started in 1947 and India got independence from UK in 1947. And from this, somehow you're able to uh, synthesize and figure out what the answer is. And the answer is India here, okay? Um, so that's you know the definition and some example to get us started. Now, the Main question I'm posing here is, you know, what is the problem with multi-hop QA, assuming that there is a problem, right? So there's been huge amounts of progress in the last few years. Uh, I don't need to tell you that deep learning has sort of uh, delivered wonderful advances for us. And every day uh, we seem to get new models that seem to have, uh, you know, better capabilities or at least better numbers in terms of uh, whatever metrics we are using to, to track these progress, right? Uh, but I'm going to argue that there is a problem with multi-hop QA and the problem or the data sets themselves. Okay, what do I mean by this? So let's you know think about how the data sets that we use for um, you know both building and uh, testing our question answering uh, models look like. Okay, so typically there's going to be some textual source, uh, maybe paragraphs or documents or what have you, um, things like you know Wikipedia, maybe any open source that you have you collect these things and then you present them um, to crowd workers who graciously agree to look at these paragraphs and then come up with 
some questions that are supposed supposedly um, requiring you to combine different pieces of information within the paragraphs you've collected or within the documents you've collected in order to answer them, right? So this is typically done in sort of a one, uh, one shot process. Now, really in this, uh, in this setup, what happens is the humans are the ones who are deciding uh, when uh, the sort of, uh, or which pieces of information needs to be combined. And the hope is that we think models will also have to do uh, the same kind of synthesis that uh, the humans had to do in order to arrive at the answer. And therefore these are going to require multi-hop reasoning, right? Um, it turns out um, that these data sets actually um, have problems uh, in particular when you train models on these data sets, they tend to struggle with what are called as artifacts. Uh, these are basically shortcuts that allow models to uh, bypass the expected reasoning you want of them in order to produce the answers. And a consequence of this is that trying to teach these models a broad variety of skills that are required to do multi-hop reasoning is uh, stymied. Okay, so the models both struggle with artifacts as well as uh, broad reasoning skills. The reason is the artifacts allow models to basically cheat, okay, uh, quote unquote cheat. Um, so let's walk through some of the ways in which you know this kind of artifacts can um, derail a proper reasoning. Okay, so we'll go back to the same example. Um, which country got independence when the Cold War started. The expectation we have here is that uh, a model might look at this question and look at the facts you have and first identify, ah, Cold War started in 1947. So now I'm going to key on 1947 and then find a fact that tells me which country got independence in 1947. Right? So I may be looking at this red puzzle piece here and say, okay, from this uh, sentence, there is some information about a country getting independence and the country uh, that actually got independence is India, right? And we are going to return this as the output. Okay? This is the expected behavior that we think uh, models will learn when trained on uh, multi-hop data sets. It turns out uh, models don't need to do this. Okay? Um, the, one of the well-known shortcuts is this answer type shortcut. So all the model needs to do is to simply look at the first part of the question. It doesn't even need to look at the rest of the question. Says which country? So the answers required for this question is of type country. So I just need to find a country within the set of facts I have. And if it turns out that the only country that's mentioned in the input that I have is India, then I might as well return it, right? There's no, 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 not even a distractor that I need to worry about, okay? So models can learn to use this kind of shortcut. One thing you might say is, okay, let's add some distractors. Um, maybe let me add uh, in, the, in the data set, let me add, at least another sentence here, right? Which is, you know, which is, which, in, which contains, which mentions another country. So it says France finally got its independence. Um, now model cannot get by with just this kind of a shortcut, this uh, answer type shortcut, right? Um, so what happens then? It turns out this answer type alone is not enough. That is adding a distractor for this answer type alone is not enough. Um, so what the models can do is actually, um, they can just extend uh, what they are looking at from the question and say, okay, let me look at this portion of the question where they say, which country got independence when? And this now helps me eliminate this France as a useful detractor, right? So I'm among the two facts I had, only one mentions some time related information because there is a mention of when I can key off and say, okay, I don't need to consider this France is a you know, the thing that I need to worry about. So all I need to look at is, is there mention of a fact which says some country got independence at some time? Okay. And the only thing that I have here is 1947, therefore I'm going to return this, right? So when the Cold War started is still not considered. Okay. So this kind of a shortcut is you know, sometimes termed as uh, the specificity based shortcut. So basically there are um, the facts can be, uh, the supporting facts that you're looking at um, individually, they can be specific enough related to the question that you might be able to identify them uh, independently, right? So what people have done to address these kinds of things is to say, look, let's, you know, not just ask models to return the answer alone, but also have them identify uh, which facts are necessary or useful in order for it to produce the answer, right? Okay, so that is a task that we can add. So you would expect that, you know, models locate these uh, blue and red puzzle facts here, and then from that synthesize and produce the answer, right? Turns out this is not enough either. Okay? It turns out that models can actually identify the supporting facts independently, 
right? So there is a fragment of the question that says the Cold War started, and there is one fact that matches this, right? So I can identify this as a supporting fact without having to worry about whether it connects to the other part of the question. And similarly, there is another part of the question which says which country got independence when, and I can identify India got independence from UK as the relevant fact for this part of the question. But again, not really connecting um, the uh, information that I get here to the other part of the question, right? So I can identify these blue and red puzzle pieces independently of each other, right? But similarly, you can find the answer again using the answer specificity, specificity shortcut that we mentioned, right? So just adding, um, these kinds of supporting sentence identification turns out is not enough. Okay, so models end up doing disconnected reasoning, right, which is you know, which is which beats the purpose of um, testing or uh, training models that can do connected reasoning to do multi-hop question answer. Okay. So all this is to sort of show you. You know, I've told you that models can exploit artifacts and cheat. Um, and I've shown you some examples of the kinds of things that uh, models can do. Right? Now, you can ask, so what, right? So, so what if models can cheat? I mean, humans use heuristics too. Um, what is the problem with this? Okay. So the problem is that uh, if models can cheat, if there is a way for them to cheat using these artif uh, artifacts during training and get by with it, they may never learn to do the proper reasoning, which is this sort of multi hop reasoning that we want them to have learned, right? Um, so that beats the purpose, uh, or that beats the purpose for, towards your goal. Um, and the other thing is when we start then using these kinds of data sets and uh, report progress about you know, how well our models are doing, this progress is actually questionable, right? Because we do not know if the progress is just in terms of numbers or if there's meaningful advance in terms of the capabilities that we are uh, after. And lastly, because models you know, try to, mm, um, try to satisfy the objective that you post to them. And if there is uh, if there is a heuristic or a shortcut based way of achieving that objective, then they don't, uh, if, if there isn't enough incentives for them to learn the right kind of reasoning, um, you know, they're not going to uh, scale well, do well uh, when you're presenting them with a harder problem where there is you know, a whole bunch of uh, broad reasoning skills that you need. So whatever I've said so far is not, you know, new or something that we, we will alone have looked at. This is a well-documented problem uh, in the multi-hop question answering world, right? So many of you are probably already aware of many of these works. Uh, people have shown that just creating data sets alone is not enough. And then there are various design choices you can uh, do that affect how well models can learn and all of these things. Right? Now, so a question you can ask now is, okay, what do you do? What is the fix for this, right? Um, so there are people who have tried to do a bunch of things and I broadly group them into two categories. One is data engineering, where you try to come up with different ways of avoiding these kinds of artifacts in the data. Um, and there's people who have looked at model engineering, where you're trying to construct or structure the models in such a way that they are incentivized to learn the kind of properties. And you can sort of say there's an inductive bias we bake into the models that then allow, allow them or like nudge them towards learning the properties. The kind of work that I'm going to talk about today largely falls under the data engineering category. Okay? In particular, um, we are contributing, uh, we're going to talk about three pieces of work. Uh, the first one we fondly call as DIER, which is short for disconnected reasoning. Um, here we're going to uh, show how we can use a very simple notion to formalize and quantify how much bad reasoning can happen in the data set and also use the same notion to then turn around and design um, tasks where that allows us to reduce this kind of bad reasoning happening in, uh, in these models. The second work I'm going to talk about is called music. Um, here we show how you can actually take, um, instead of focusing on existing data sets, we can actually construct a data set from scratch that satisfies certain properties that you would expect in a data set of uh, in a data set for multi-hop question answer. Okay. And the last thing I'm going to touch upon is uh, what we're calling a tea break. Um, here we are going to show how we could come up with synthetically generated um, data sets that can incentivize models to learn the right kinds of reasoning. Um, so that they don't fall into this uh, trap of uh, just shortcut-based reasoning so that they can actually learn a broad range of reasoning skills. Okay. So that's going to be the outline for the rest of the talk. Um, and before I proceed further, 
Um, I want to say if people have questions, I'm happy to uh, take them. Uh, as we go along, please stop and uh, ask me questions. Um, I don't see anyone else. Um, so I'm just speaking to the screen. Um, so, uh, so please uh, speak up if, you, if, you, if you'd like to interrupt me. Okay, so let's move into the first work, uh, which is uh, Dyer. Um, so here, the premise is, you know, we know that uh, there have been work that have documented that um, data sets um, can, in, can data sets contain artifacts and models can exploit these artifacts. Um, and um, some work that had shown that you could reduce this kind of um, artifact-based reasoning um, based on some specific uh, specific focusing on specific types of artifacts that existed. And so the question we wanted to ask is, is there a way for us to at least formalize, to state what it means to do a, per, at least a subclass of bad forms of uh, multi-cup reasoning, and then use that formalization to then quantify how much bad reasoning can a model do, how much bad reasoning can a model get away with on a given data set, and is there a way to reduce it? And so those were the three uh, main goals that we had um, for this particular work. Let's go back to our running example. Okay, um, now I've thrown away all the text, but let's say we have a question and we have uh, the associated um, facts as context. This goes as input to the problem. And for simplicity, I've shown you um, sentences as associated facts, right? That, but they don't need to be. You can have paragraphs as the input context, a set of paragraphs within which there are uh, some small portions that are relevant to answering the question, which you can think of as supporting facts, right? So in this case, our red puzzle piece and the blue puzzle piece denote two facts that are necessary and contain supporting information for answering that question, okay? Um, so this is our running example here. Now, Let's take this input, uh, this, this setup we have, and let's now you know, do some modifications to the, the input context we have, okay? So in particular, I take uh, the input context we have and I remove the puzzle piece, which I am showing in the top, okay? And then in the bottom, I'm removing the red puzzle piece. Basically, I'm removing some facts, supporting fact from the context, right? So now I have two partitions of the, uh, uh, two partitions of the input context, and I have the associated question with them. Right? So this is a modified input and then what is started with. Now I can feed each of these uh, modified contexts to the question answering model that we are training and ask it to identify what the supporting facts are. Okay? Um, so if the, if the model can take the first, the, the top um, modified context and return the red puzzle piece as a supporting fact and the bottom one can then return the blue supporting uh, fact here, and then we basically combine these two using some simple operation after post hoc operation after they have returned the results. Then we get the exact expected predicted output, right? Which is identifying the supporting facts. Okay, let's say a model is able to do this. Then I'm arguing that this is a model that is doing a form of bad reasoning, right? Why? Because at least in one of these cases, the model should not be should not have been able to identify the supporting fact because that supporting fact identification had to rely on information it had gotten from a different supporting fact. And because we have removed the supporting facts, uh, one supporting fact from each of these contexts, at least in one of these cases, the model should have failed. So if a model doesn't fail here, then it is doing a bad form of reasoning, right? The same um, kind of reasoning can happen with respect to uh, the answer also. So the model should not have been able to return the correct answer because one of the supporting facts is actually missing, right? So if I use some simple heuristic on top of the answers returned by the model, I shouldn't be able to get the correct answer. Okay? If the model does both of these things, then we would claim that this model is actually doing disconnected reasoning here, right? Now I should sort of frame this, um, I, should, uh, I should sort of note that, um, the assumption that we're beginning with is that the supporting facts that are present in the question, right, are um, sufficient as well as necessary for answering the question, right? So that's the that's the whole point of um, creating multi-hub data sets like this. With large language models, this, this becomes a little bit icky because some of these models can contain these kinds of supporting facts from their pre-training knowledge. So I'm happy to talk about that a little bit later, but for now, we would assume that our goal 
is for models to actually recognize when the supporting facts are present uh, before pro providing an answer, right? So these two, uh, if, if a model is able to then return the supporting facts and the answers without actually on these kind of depleted context, then we, we are in trouble, right? We don't know if the model is actually doing multi-hypothesis in that case. So you can formalize this a little bit and say, okay, I can create uh, these kinds of uh, bipartitions where I take uh, different subsets of the supporting facts that are removed and I can enumerate a lot of these partitions. And then I can ask whether um, a model, uh, when we apply the model on these, uh, on these independent partitions, if it's able to get the correct answer or not in, in all of these uh, partitions that I can do, right? So in fact, in any of these partitions, the model should not be able to get the correct answer. And if it gets it, then we, we are going to call that this is a bad reason, okay? Um, so there is a way to you know, formally state this. I will skip um, the reading this, but I just what I want to say is that you can turn that simple notion into a, into, into a formal requirement, right? And we can call this as the disconnected reasoning condition. If this condition is met, then we say that the model uh, can do disconnected reasoning in this setting. So with this formalization, we can do two kinds of measures. We can measure disconnected reasoning that a model does on a particular data set B. And we can also measure the you know, maximum possible disconnected reasoning any model could do on this data set. Okay? So uh, let's look at the first piece. The way we do this is again by taking each instance that exists in a, a given data set, and we create these kinds of uh, partitions with supporting facts missing, and we can create a group of instances uh, of this uh, depleted uh, context, which we can call as probing instances. And you can then measure how well a model does on this probing instances, right? So if you can take this uh, probing instances and have uh, the model give you partial answers and take union of them, and if you get the correct answer, then uh, this is a problem. So we can now repeat this process over all the uh, instances that you have in your current training data, and you can start measuring how much uh, disconnected reasoning is happening. So uh, what you can do is given a data set, you can apply um, the original model on the data set. And let's say you get some score, which I am representing by this blue bar here. And I'm gonna take uh, this data set and produce this probing instances that I just talked about, right? For each of these questions, I can create uh, a, a group of probing instances. And then I can now measure how well the same model is able to do on this probed data instance, uh, on this probing data set, right? So on this probing data set, the model should fail because all of these contexts are depleted contexts, right? So if the model is able to get some number of uh, answers correct here, then that represents the amount of uh, disconnected reasoning the model is able to do, okay? So this is the basic idea that we can use for measuring disconnected reasoning on a data set, or oh, sorry, on uh, a bio model, right? Now we can, use the same idea to then measure, you know, given a data set, you know, how susceptible is this data set for, you know, disconnected reasoning. You can do this by taking whatever is your state of the art model at hand, and then taking the best model you have and directly optimize on the probing data set, and then, you know, produce uh, the, the number for the probe uh, on that probing data set. And you can claim that is the amount by which uh, any of the current models can uh, get away with on this particular data set using disconnected reasoning. All right, so, so far I've shown you how we can you know, formalize this notion of one type of bad reasoning in multi-hop uh, QL systems, which is this notion of disconnected reasoning. Uh, we can formalize, uh, formally state when the model is doing disconnected reasoning, and we can now measure how much disconnected reasoning happens on a particular model and on a particular data set. We can, um, based on this, we were, able, uh, we were also able to uh, devise uh, some incentives that then uh, we hope can help models reduce uh, this kind of disconnected reasoning. Okay? And I'm not going to go into details of this, but um, the basic idea is to is to incentivize models to learn the notion of sufficiency. That is, when is a context containing all of the information that is necessary uh, to provide an, uh, in order to give an answer. And so we can actually um, use the same kind of partitions that we have created and create a new task where you're just asking the model to look at the context and say whether it's a complete context or sufficient context or an insufficient context, right? And we can create a contrastive task on this because you're making some small edits and then um, you can make uh, these minimally sufficient uh, negatives. And you can ask models when they train to produce the answer to also um, 
do this additional task that we are asking it to do. And this then nudges or incentivizes the model to uh, not do disconnected reasoning as much. Okay? And in fact, uh, our experiments show that this, that this actually helps reduce um, this kind of bad reasoning. Okay, um, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna sort of rush through the experimental setup and details, but I'm happy to answer questions later. Um, or if you have so. Um, so we did some experiments on a hotbot QA data set. Uh, for this kind of approach to work, um, what we require is that the data set contain uh, annotations of where the supporting facts are, and that we assume the supporting facts are sufficient and necessary to answer the questions. Okay. Um, here I'm just going to show you numbers with uh, an RNN baseline and ExcelNet base, which was the best model at the time when we did this work on hotbot QA. Right. So one question you can answer now is how much disconnected reasoning do models do on hotpot QA? Okay. So here I'm showing you on one particular metric, which is just the answer accuracy. What I'm showing you here is how much the RNN baseline got on hotpot QA under standard training and how much the ExcelNet model got on hotpot QA under standard training. Right. So you can sort of see the RNN baseline got 60 and this, this gets close to 72. So you could say there's about a 12 point gain uh, or an improvement in multi-hop reasoning uh, if you had to, you know, if you had to say that going from RNNs and ExcelNet is, is an, it's an improvement, right? So now what I'm showing you is some annotations that tell you how much disconnected reasoning is going on, right? So I told you that we can actually create this probing instances and a probing data set, and we can actually measure how much disconnected reasoning is happening. So what you see here is that uh, the bottom regions of these two bars show how much uh, reasoning was actually achieved via connected reasoning, and the rest is uh, something we can attribute to disconnected reasoning by right, using the probe-based measurement we have. So you can actually see that going from RNN to uh, XLNet, while there was a 12-point gain, um, uh, it turns out that bulk of it seems to be um, achieved only through disconnected reasoning, right? Um, so there's only a two-point uh, relative improvement we may you know, attribute to direct multi-hop uh, reasoning improvements. So the other question we can ask is, okay, so we, um, I, I also mentioned that we can do um, a transformation uh, to the data set that can, uh, this uh, contrasted support sufficiency test that I talked about, does it actually reduce the cheatability uh, on hotpot QA? Okay. So here um, we take uh, the excellent model that was originally trained uh, on the probe data set of hotpot QA. Again, remember probe, is, probe data set is the one that uh, tells us how much disconnected reasoning is going on. Um, and we are now going to test uh, if you take the original hotpot QA and you use ExcelNet, how much can ExcelNet cheat on this hotpot QA data set through disconnected reasoning? And then we show this transform data set uh, where you know models can't uh, cheat because we have this additional transformation we described. And we can measure how much ExcelNet does on this transform data set. Okay. Here we see that. Um, that the transformation that we can do um, directly reduces the cheatability by as much as 20 points. Right? So, um, so to conclude, basically uh, this part of the talk, um, what we have shown is that if you just simply take this notion that um, if, if all the supporting facts are not mentioned in a particular context, the model should not be able to get the correct answer. You can take that simple notion, you can formalize it, you can use it to measure how much disconnected reasoning a model can do, a data set can do, you can, um, you can then also go ahead and design incentives that allows, uh, that forces models to not rely on disconnected reasoning as much. And uh, you can get uh, reduced cheatability in these models, right? So if you're a designer uh, of a multi-hop model, you can use the probe data set that we're talking about to see how susceptible your model is for, multi for disconnected reasoning. If you are a data set designer, uh, then you can use our probing instances to test the cheatability on your data set. You can also reduce the possible amount of disconnected reasoning it could be in your data set by doing the transformation that we mentioned. Okay. Pause here and maybe ask, uh, let people ask questions. Did you get, can you hear me Naranjan? Yes. So I, I'm curious about uh, these experiments. If you can't answer the question, are you supposed to say, I don't have an answer? Or are you supposed to guess? So, so in your, in your uh, probing data sets, it should not be possible to get the answer, right? 
because it should not be possible to get the answer yet. So is is this is in a, in that case should a system be saying there is no answer? Right. The system should be able to recognize that that's an insufficient context and should not be able to say an answer. Okay. So okay. So I was just kind of wondering because if you if you the system could still guess. I mean, if it doesn't have the multi-hop information, it could right. randomly guess France or India, hoping that right. it's right. But if you're if you're going to then penalize them for in, right. like it's every answer wrong in that case. Yeah, absolutely. If you force the model to give an answer, it is going to give an answer, and it might still get the correct answer. So, so it, at least in the data set perspective. So here's one way to think about this, right? So if you're designing a data set and you have a question, and the question could be answered by a model, even when one of the supporting facts is missing, then you don't quite have a proper multi-hop question, right? Because the uncertainty associated with the answer doesn't change as much, right? Um, but you want to make sure that the task that you're defining, designing um, ensures that the model is you know, forced to uh, make a decision on whether the context is sufficient or not, rather than just always having to guess something. Right, okay. And so these experiments though are doing that. There's the correct answer is no answer. Right. In, in most of these cases. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right, so, okay. So let me get to the second part. I don't know how I'm doing on time. I can't see the, um, okay. So I'm about two or five. So it's about 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so, right, so we saw how to work with an existing data set as long as it contains some supporting facts, right? Um, and then um, uh, you, can, you can modify it and whatnot, but still uh, effectively um, what you're left with is the questions that you have already created, right? So now uh, the next thing that we looked at in the space is say, okay, can we actually construct um, new data sets um, the, with the properties that we desire for uh, these multi-hub questions that, that we want in this data set. Okay. So this was the big, this was the motivation for our uh, second work, music um, here. Um, and the motivation was to say, okay, let's, you know, the, the controlling for the properties that we want in the data set with this sort of one shot construction is difficult. You can ask humans to give you some questions and later on you figure out these questions might contain artifacts and you have to toss them out and then you go back and ask more questions. So it seems like um, uh, not a very efficient way to get large large amounts of data. And even uh, and, and in the first place, it's very hard for humans, where, uh, for, um, for us to actually um, a priori figure out whether the questions are going to be cheatable by a model unless you do the experiments, right? So um, a priori, it's hard to guess what, what kinds of questions might contain artifacts um, just by looking at them. Uh, without doing experiments and B, it just seems like you are stuck with only filtering things rather than being able to create questions that have good properties in the first place. Okay. So to do this, we use uh, a bottom-up process. Okay. Um, so the idea is that there has been a lot of work um, that has looked at creating uh, question answering data sets. Um, if you think about um, you know, uh, multi-hop uh, questions, um, not only is the reasoning um, necessarily about multi-hop thing, but you can also think about the question itself is a collection of multiple information needs that are stitched together, right? so they are connected together. So we said, okay, why don't we look at single hop questions uh, at scale and then try to see which single hop questions can be connected together. Um, and that gives us a large space of um, um, you know, uh, two hop questions, and you can take these two hop questions and then try to connect them together and get four hop questions and so on and so forth, right? So this process of composing questions in a bottom-up manner can give us a really large space of uh, multi-hop questions, as long as we are able to find enough coverage for these kinds of connections that might exist between these questions, right? So if you do such a thing, then if you had a way, a good way of filtering out um, or identifying what constitutes a good multi-hop question based on the properties that we get to set, then we can filter those out and we can get these sort of connected questions of varying number of hops. And those you could give to crowd workers and then turn that into some kind of a natural looking question. So this is the process that we, uh, we uh, started with. Okay, so let's say, let's use this bottom up process. It gives us better control uh, it gives us a large space of questions to explore, and we can have uh, better control over what questions get um, created. Right. 
So the humans are still used in this process, but uh, only to create natural questions out of the multi-hub questions that we already created. Okay. So then the key question here to answer is what constitutes good and bad questions? Okay. So you know, based on all the you know, research that has been done, we, there is a bunch of things that we know need to be part of good uh, question answering data sets in general, and especially for multi-hub. Right? So these are the four properties that we identified. Um, step dependence, context dependence, uh, support sufficiency, and then uh, having better control on how train, you know, there is leakage from questions from training set to test set. So let's go through uh, at least a few of this uh, in, in some detail. So let's look at step dependence first. Okay. So here, um, like, uh, let's go back to our question, which country got independence when the Cold War started? Okay. Now you can look at this question and say it consists of two sub questions. Right? But the first question is, when did the Cold War start? And let's say the answer to this is answer one. Then the second question depends on this answer one. Right? So which country got independence in the year answer one? Okay? So the, the multi-hub question can be broken down into these sets of connected steps that you have to um, solve in order to provide the answer. So what step dependence uh, for us um, um, should look like is this. So if I take the first question and I look at this uh, context, I'd identify that the uh, answer is 1947, right? So the model uh, identifies this. Then if I take the second sub question and plug in the value 1947 into the answer one slot, now I have uh, a fully fleshed out second question. Now I can look uh, for the fact that satisfies this uh, fleshed out sub question uh, and I can get the answer India from this, right? So the model should be able to do this. So this is what a question should force the model to do. In other words, if I had removed that information, 1947, from the second question, a model or you or I should not be able to give the correct answer to this question, right? Because it's underspecified, right? So if you have a question that where a model can take this underspecified sub-question, and is able to return an answer, then that question is a bad question, right? It's not requiring step dependence. So we can get rid of that question. Okay, so let's look at the sec second property, which is context dependence. So here we can take um, each sub question that we have, and we should ensure that the sub question should not be answerable with a without appropriate context. Okay, so let's go back to um, the question two we had, right? Um, which country got independence? Let's say now we have filled in the correct uh, connecting entity, which is 1947 here. And in this context, there is enough information in the context in order for us to give the correct answer. Okay, so we can um, return India as the correct answer here. Suppose we remove this fact. Okay, now a model should not be able to give the correct answer to this because it's not part of the input context. If the model in fact gives the correct answer India, even in this case, then this question is not a useful question because the context is not test, this context is not really necessary for the model to provide an answer. Right? So we can throw away questions that contain sub questions of this form. The other uh, thing we can check is I, I mentioned this earlier, like we want models to assess whether all the supporting facts are present. Um, we can again create, um, so those two are, the previous two properties are uh, properties that we can use to filter good and bad questions. Um, here, we can improve the um, data set um, reliability by adding these kinds of contrastive questions, where again, we create a question where we take one of the sub questions and we remove from the context, the necessary information to answer that sub question. Now, this question as a whole is no longer answerable. Okay? So, we associate a no answer or an unanswerable uh, label to this particular question. So, not only can we create questions where models can't uh, skip uh, step dependence or context dependence, we can also include additional questions which can trip models up uh, by you know, forcing them to return a no answer when there isn't enough information to provide the answer. Okay, so we can do things like this. The other thing we can do, um, so one of the known problems with multi-hub or uh, general question answering data sets is that 
uh, there can be leakage from training to test. So a question that appears uh, in the training data, some similar version of it might appear in the test data or a question for which uh, the answer uh, for a question might be also an answer to another question in the test data and so on. So we want to minimize training test data leakage so that there is no simple memorization heuristics model can use in order to achieve better performance in test sets. So what we can do in this kind of multi-hop setting is that we can even ensure that the sub-questions are not memorized code, right? So again, greater amounts of control that we have. So we get finer grain control for building data sets. There are additional benefits that we get um, with this kind of uh, process. So one, we actually get decompositions for free, right? So um, the multi-hop question that we end up creating is create, we create them from sub-questions, right? So we are actually composing them together. So we do know what sub-questions are involved in order to answer the, the main multi-hop question, right? So and this notion of having decompositions of question has been, excuse me, uh, is useful uh, if you're trying to, again, design models that take the right kinds of reasoning steps. The other benefit we get is that because we are doing this in an automatic fashion, we can again control the types of reasoning graphs that we can create, not just chains, but maybe other structures and the number of hops we want and so on. Right? To the, the caveat is that you can't go really long hops after which creating questions become really, really unnatural. Right? Um, so um, we, I think in the paper, we created about six different types of uh, graphs uh, with varying degrees of hops going from one to four hops. So using this process, using this kind of simple filtering, we were able to create um, uh, two versions of our data set. Um, one is uh, called, which we call music answerable, which contains the only questions it contains are all the answerable questions that are answerable uh, with, the, with the given context um, with two to four hops. And then we have this additional set uh, with this contrastive unanswerable sub-questions, um, the, the leaderboards and code, uh, and code are up there. And the thing I want to show you next is that, with, so how good is this data set, right? So there are other data sets out there, you know, what is this really producing um, a good data set along the dimensions that we care about? Um, so I'm not going to go into details of these the models that we tried, but basically we picked the, you know, best performing model on, um, uh, on, uh, on similar data sets. And then we, um, we use this pipeline. Basically, this is a very simple um, retrieve first and then, um, and then try to answer setup, right? So we have a question. We have a bunch of context associated with this question in our music data set. We first use a uh, Roberta large model to give us uh, the top K paragraphs that are more likely, most likely to answer this question and then feed uh, the question and the top K paragraphs to a long former model, which is able to handle large context uh, because we have about 20, um, uh, 20, uh, 20 paragraphs to begin with, and then they get whittled down to a few paragraphs. So we want to handle um, handle cases where you have large input context. So we get uh, we can get answers and supporting paragraphs, and also the label on answerability. Right. So this is for the case where there is an insufficient context, then the model should be able to say, okay, this question is not answerable because a crucial piece of answer is missing. It right? doesn't need to say which piece is missing, but it needs to say whether the answer uh, it can be answered or not. Okay. So. We compare um, the performance of this best model on music, which is MQ here, the third bar, uh, and on hotpot QA and two wiki, two other data sets. Okay, so our music data set is of uh, contains uh, relatively smaller number of instances compared to other data sets. So we subsample those data sets to also show that the, the uh, difference in performance is not simply attributed to uh, the, the reduction in size, right? So what we see here is that the best model performance we get on the music data set is about 47 uh, and the human upper bound on this task. This is a challenging task for humans too, because we, you know, there's a number of hops are there. Um, so they have to look at a bunch of different paragraphs and provide an answer. They get about 88.6, but the human upper bound is similar to the other data sets as well. But then the models can do substantially better on these data sets, right? So we see a bigger gap on uh, the music data set. Now, this is just on the uh, data set where all questions are answerable. Okay. Um, so the other point we can check is, so that's the, you know, that just says that the data set is hard, um, but is it harder for models to game or cheat on this data set, right? So we actually uh, took an, uh, one kind of um, shortcut based reasoning model, which is called the single para model, which is essentially processing each paragraph independently and then extracting an answer that is 
exactly the opposite of what you want to do for disk uh, for uh, multi crop reasoning where you need to synthesize information from different places and you can see that this single paragraph model can actually get high uh, scores on hotpot qa and true eq right so if you look at the you know, best performance of these models uh, on all questions uh, so, so the best performing model gets about 75 um, uh, but this cheating models uh, or this artifact based model gets about 65 right so there's not a huge drop in performance but on music, these models, uh, this kind of a cheating model gets substantially low performance also, right? So it only you know, gets 32. Now, if we take, take the full data set where you have this unanswerability or this answerability thing into consideration, uh, this kind of a cheating model fails miserably, right? You get only 2.3. Okay, so that's on the, the second part of the talk, right? Whereas now we have shown that um, there is a way for us to construct um, large scale data sets by exploiting or taking, uh, making use of existing uh, question answering data set, um, rather than doing a one shot construction process, we, if we do this bottom up controllable process, then we can actually avoid uh, some of the uh, artifacts that exist in the natural data sets and actually can produce a harder data sets uh, where it's difficult for models to get by with just uh, non multi hop reasoning. So now we get to the uh, third part of the talk. I have about maybe 10 minutes, so I'll try to rush through this a little bit so I leave time for questions. So in this um, um, piece, what, uh, what I want to talk about is um, how um, we can you know, uh, incentivize models to actually learn a broad range of skills that are, uh, that are useful for multi hop reasoning. Okay? So as I said before, if data sets contain, because data sets contain artifacts, uh, this, this, seems to be a, this seems to be a difficult thing to do. Okay, so this uh, is appearing in EMLP 2022. Um, so effectively, there are large number of uh, multi-hop data sets that uh, target complex multi-hop reasoning skills. Okay, so what do I mean by complex multi-hop skills here? The individual skills themselves are hard. I'll show you quickly examples of what, what, what these kinds of skills are. And then there is a wide variety of these skills which needs to be composed. So there is many different ways in which you need to compose these skills in order to provide uh, the answer, right? So these are complex multi-hop data sets. And the skills look like this. For example, um, if you want to, so if you take this question, how many touchdowns did Edwards throw in the first quarter? Um, to do this, you actually need to be able to list the touchdowns or identify the touchdowns that were made by this, uh, uh, particular person, and then filter the ones that you have there down to the ones that were made in the first quarter, and then take the remaining ones and count them, right? So there are many data sets where um, these kinds of, the same kinds of, or same sets of skills are being asked about, okay? Um, and this, these contain really large, uh, you know, reasonably, reasonably large number of instances, okay? So then why don't models learn this? The answer is the same. Okay, so the natural context in these data sets, that is the paragraphs that, uh, that, that exist in these data sets, often allow models to take shortcuts. Okay. So the thing that we've wondered, um, so I'll skip this example uh, in the interest of time. The thing that we wondered is, okay, what can you do to address this, right? One thing you could say, so is there a way for me to get rid of the artifacts that are in the natural context and, you know, um, or do the kinds of transformations we talked about earlier? Um, we wanted to see, uh, what can we do with the synthetic context? Okay, so meaning um, the questions are good. We do get natural questions that test for complex behavior, uh, but it is the context that have the problem. Is there a way that we can actually, you know, forget the natural context for a while and instead use automatically generated context that uh, have certain properties for the same questions still? Right? The questions are natural. Somehow can we create artificial context uh, for in which these questions can be answered? But not without doing proper reasoning. That is, you can't take the synthetic context and somehow do shortcut reasoning and get away. Okay? So in synthetic context, again, you have greater degrees of control. Right? So in this work, we said, okay, can we do this? Um, so the pipeline we use to build these kinds of synthetic context is as follows. Can we take a question, multi-hop question, and we get a decomposition of it. So this is what is called as QDMR. There are some data sets where this kind of a decomposition is already given to us for natural questions. And what we do is from this decomposition, we turn it into a typed program from which we can sample different kinds of context and answers. Okay, so I'll quickly brush through what I mean by this. So here's a question, uh, which player had the least number of field goals? 
Okay. And this is broken down into the step of set of steps that you need, right? You can see that there are placeholders that connect information from one sub question to the other and so on. You can almost think of this like as this some program that you need to execute, right? And this comes from a previous work. We didn't have to invent this. Then what we did is we take this and then we turn it into uh, a kind of a typed program. And with this, we can, this type program we use to create various contests. Again, um, I'll skip over the details of how we actually do this and I'll tell you what kinds of things we can do with this kind of synthetic context generation, right? So we take, so for example, we take this question and we see that it's broken down into these three steps, listing of some named entities, uh, the selection, the filtering, and then the counting, right? Those are the three operations you have. And for each of these sub questions, we can automatically create um, the synthetic context. So if you look at the synthetic context, it's basically um, you know, just like a map from uh, some part of the question to a new entity, a synthetically created entity, like these ABCs, DXC, FG, H, et cetera, are entities that we create. Okay? So we can ensure uh, by in, in these kinds of uh, synthetic contexts, we can ensure multiple kinds of properties that we care about. So one property which we talked about earlier is this notion of step dependence, right? So where um, to answer uh, the step two correctly, I need to use information that I got from step one, okay? So without step one's answers being correct, I should not be able to get the answer to step two correct, okay? So you can set up the context that you create for step two mm -hmm. such that you have additional distracted entities so that if the model only looked at the step two related question without knowing the answer from the first step, it won't have, uh, it won't be able to figure out which amongst these four entities that it can return. Okay. The other property that we uh, notice can happen sometimes is that some step can be uh, a no op. So meaning if you take the information from the uh, first step and just pass it along without doing any modification to the answer from the first step to the subsequent step, then that is again, uh, that renders this intermediate step useless, right? So you can control for this again by um, making sure that uh, you add corresponding synthetic uh, context for this that make us detractors. Okay. And the last thing that we do is uh, focus on what is called as question dependence. Okay, so in this case, um, we want to make sure that the answer to any question cannot be provided correctly without actually understanding the question in its entirety, right? So for example, uh, if a model learns only to say, uh, return an entity based on whether uh, it is from a quarter, rather than knowing whether it's from first quarter or second quarter, then it's not doing the correct reasoning, right? So you can actually add detractors. For example, in this case, you can add facts that are from second quarter, which is not the, what the question is asking about. So the model needs to also you know, fully understand the question. Okay? So any, um, the, co the question cannot be ignored if you create synthetic context like this. Okay, so again, uh, very highly, uh, at a high level, those are the three major properties that we talked about at a question level, right? So each question, we can create synthetic context that looks like this. And then as a data set as a whole, again, if you want models to learn um, certain kinds of uh, reasoning skills and certain kinds of reasoning patterns, then it really uh, is important to know how these kinds of reasoning patterns are distributed in your data, okay? So note that we are creating um, all these synthetic contexts for existing multi-hop questions that are sourced from, um, sourced from naturally created data sets, right? So those data sets have a specific distribution. And in fact, it's a long tail distribution of the kinds of reasoning patterns that one might observe, okay? So, if you train on a data set that has this kind of a reasoning pattern distribution, then it is going to be the case that on the test data, if you have samples from the long tail, the model is not going to be able to generalize to that very well, right? So what we can do here though, is that in our um, uh, data set creation process, we can actually play around with the reasoning patterns um, by oversampling or making small changes to the to the two DMRs that we have and create a better reasoning distribution before the model is exposed to more of the um, uh, infrequent reasoning distributions here. Okay. All right, so with this, we were able to create yeah, yeah. the data set. Uh, Sorry. I apologize uh, for interrupting. Uh, I, we will lose this conference room in three minutes. I just want to give you an answer. <laughs> I see, okay. So let me sort of quickly jump to the last slide then. So what we showed is that you can actually um, uh, take the synthetic 
uh, synthetically derived uh, data set and use that as a pre-training data set to create a QA model that then ho hopefully learns to not do artifact-based reasoning and then take this pre-trained model and fine tune on a target data set, right? And I will skip the good things happen parts of this um, and just come right to the takeaway, right? So the broad takeaways uh, based on these three words, I would say is that uh, we need rigor in our measurements. Um, I've learned a few good things from James while I was there, right? I'm sure he'd agree. Um, the other thing is that the input output behavior, measuring this alone is clearly not enough, right? Because models uh, find various ways uh, to, to, to game. And lastly, uh, it turns out the synthetic context uh, transfer uh, over to natural data sets. And I think that's very exciting. Um, we are not the first to show this. There are other people who are showing this too. So I'm very excited for this direction where we can obtain greater control over how things transfer. Okay. Um, we have uh, all the data sets here. Um, and you know, if, you're, uh, if you're interested in the kind of work we're doing, there's other pieces that the lab is doing. So I'll just throw it out there. And these are the wonderful people I work with. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I didn't realize we'll lose the uh, conference room. Otherwise, I would have been a little bit more careful with time. No worries, no worries. Uh, thank you so much for, for the very interesting talk and very timely. Uh, in our explorations, we also have observed similar kind of um, shortcomings of the Hot Plus QA data sets, and really appreciate you talking about this topic. So is there any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Is there any questions from the audience here? James. I know you have 30 seconds, but uh, um, I was wondering if you could say, maybe I missed it. How did you decompose the questions in the second part when you're constructing the corpus? I mean, you talked about using QDMA or something, MR, something yeah. like that at the end. So. Uh, yeah, so the, there are a whole bunch of data sets for this QDMR is available to us, so you can use them. There is also um, uh, models that can actually produce this question decomposition also. I think we, we tried experiments with those as well, uh, but just taking the existing data sets for which we have QDMRs is, is enough because you can create many synthetic examples. Okay, so the data set already has the decomposition. Yeah, it was manually created. And I was wondering why you, why you wouldn't couldn't imagine a data set where the first question would be, what is independence? Right? Oh, I see. Your yeah. question was, yeah, when was the Cold War? When did the country gain independence? But why couldn't the first question be, what is independence? Where the answer might be leaving the British Empire or something like that. Um, yeah, I think that, that's a great question, right? So um, the, the question decomposition is, is done almost independently of context and you know there's no assumption about which model is going to do the answering using this decomposition so it is not an so doing decomposition independently in vacuum is a perilous affair but we need some breakdown like some uh, breakdown of the of the question into some steps so that's how yeah it's it it's a valid criticism it's not clear how you would do this independent of context so if i gave you um, two paragraphs from which you're supposed to answer the question, and then I gave you a specific model which tells you all the things that it, that it knows, then you could argue, okay, this is how you should do the decomposition given this breakdown, right? But yeah, it's it, uh, this this was this is a legitimate criticism and how that's how the data set is constructed, but my answer would be, you have to start somewhere and I think that's a good start. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's thanks, Dr. one more time. Thank you.